Thank you so much. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Uh, thank you to Haruv USA and to OU Tulsa. I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be present with all of you today. So this is, uh, as I was telling Gal earlier um, and Christina, this is a pretty heavy topic. Um, it's something that's interested me for quite some time. Um, I've uh, have been interested for, for a long time in how we can be um, thinking about this and reflecting on this topic, um, you know, as we engage with children and families. And so um, I'm really happy to be here. As Gal said, I currently work at the Parent Child Center of Tulsa, and uh, I'm an infant and early childhood mental health community consultant there. And um, I'm just pleased to be a part of of this lecture series. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Today we're talking about fostering health equity in young children by implementing culturally competent approaches. So quite a mouthful, but I'll break it down for us as we proceed this morning. So I thought it would be important, given the topic that we are um, addressing this morning, to uh, talk a little bit about um, you know, who I am as a professional. So again, I, I just explained to you that I uh, am working at the Parent Child Center, but I actually didn't start there until November of 2019. Um, prior to that, I lived in Ohio all of my life, besides the time that I spent outside, um, you know, uh, learning, getting my graduate degree, um, et cetera. So um, my passion has always been with children, especially young children, infants, and um, you know, the early childhood years have always been kind of a focus of mine for the last, I guess, 20 years. Um, but I wanted to also say that, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that I come from a biased perspective. Um, you know, this has been influenced by my education, obviously, and the limited experiences that I've had based on uh, my family interactions, you know, where I've lived um, and who I've lived around. So I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, that piece. My really, my, my wish for today is that everyone um, who's present uh, in sharing this topic with me will hear something new to spark uh, more curiosity, more learning. Uh, with a 45, 50 minute window of time, we don't have obviously a lot of time to dive deep into the topic. And so I hope to just inspire people to, to look further. Um, so that's why I put the two, the two pictures here of Oklahoma and Ohio, because those um, so far in my life have been the biggest uh, influence, influencers into who I am. I know that we all have a part in enhancing the lives of young children, and I know that's why you're here today, so thank you. As far as official objectives, um, we're going to look a little bit at SAMHSA, so the Substance Abuse uh, Mental Health Services Administration's definitions related to health equity and cultural competence this morning. Um, we will uh, reflect on how dis uh, historical discrimination, especially as it's um, um, impacted by regional lines, contributes to inequities in services and uh, how those inequities have negative impacts on young children. We'll learn ways to embrace, uh, we'll end by learning ways to embrace anti-bias and diversity informed practice, um, really to combat hopefully uh, the impacts of that historical discrimination and racism and to help young children thrive because I assume that uh, most of you are working in that, in that arena. I think it's important as we reflect on best practice, and typically this is, um, this is something that I like to, to cover more when we are doing in-person uh, training opportunities because people obviously are interacting more closely, but I think it's still important to say that we need to be respectful of everyone who is on the call and the diverse and unique backgrounds that they come from, the experiences and opinions that they have will be influenced by those. Um, I wanna acknowledge that it's important that we are here to understand, gain some knowledge uh, to help us to continue to, to grow as professionals. So I hope that you can challenge your biases and maybe commit to do at least one thing differently after being a, um, present this morning. So I think, um, it's important to say, and obviously this, um, this is a topic that I have talked about um, in the past, but given our recent national events, I think it's important um, to really acknowledge those, first of all, to take a minute to do that, and then to just reflect on why this topic is so important. Um, 
I think that, uh, you know, these events have shown that we're a nation struggling. Um, there are historical and structural inequalities across systems uh, in all sectors. Um, and I think that we are seeing the results of some, um, you know, some outcry for, for change. And so I think it's important to, you know, take some time um, to really uh, acknowledge that we need to shed some light on these systems of oppression and try to be the change and create uh, lives that are different for people, especially uh, starting at early ages. And so um, I just wanted to take a minute to pause and um, give some respect to the current circumstances that we um, as a nation are experiencing. All right, so as I said, uh, we're gonna look first at the Substance, Service, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration's definitions related to cultural competence. So I wanted to acknowledge that these definitions come from the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services um, in Health and Healthcare. And so they are um, really a list uh, of services that we can put in place, and there's 15 total standards that we can put in place to really improve the work that we do with children and families if we're in the health or mental health sector. So the standards are um, in three different categories. There's 15 total standards. And I don't know, some of you may have seen these in the past, but they really um, are impactful to guide some of the work that we do in the sectors that we're working. The first one is governance, leadership, and workforce. Uh, so, so there are some standards related to that topic. The second is communication, language, and assistance. So again, a very important piece. And uh, the third is engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. And so I think, again, important to acknowledge where these definitions are coming from as we reflect on what we're thinking about today. So the first definition is around uh, health disparities. And so we need to recognize that health disparities adversely affect the groups of people um, that we are working with. And these um, really relate to health obstacles and mental health obstacles that, um, that individuals experience as a, result, as a result of the, um, the disparities that are, um, that are out there. So uh, the obstacles that relate to disparities, as you'll see on the slide of uh, racial, obviously socioeconomic status, age, um, some of these we reflect more on than others. Uh, cognitive sensory or physical disabilities. So again, we're not just talking about one uh, obstacle, we're talking about all of these combined. Um, sexual orientation, geographic location, which I will spend some time um, reflecting on this morning. Mental health, uh, religion, gender, and again, we will reflect on historical discrimination. So again, all of these obstacles really um, connect to how healthy we are as individuals living um, in the United States. So uh, there's health disparity and then we have to uh, look at behavioral health disparities. And so this is really the difference in substance use or mental health outcomes that are linked to some of those obstacles, uh, social, economic, and or environmental circumstances. So really these are the things that put us at a disadvantage to have um, healthy outcomes related to our mental health um, and substance use. Health equity, which is what we're striving for, for all people, is the attainment of the highest level of health possible for all groups. So we acknowledge that sometimes individual differences and or history can create barriers to achieving good health. So I think health equi equity emphasizes giving people access to the same resources or opportunities. Um, when I was a consultant, one of the uh, ways that this was apparent to me in terms of of health and uh, mental health outcomes was just uh, equity in terms of childcare. So early childcare, I was a consultant for Head Start early in my uh, career. And one of the things that I noticed early on was that depending on where you lived, you had an opportunity to access certain childcare centers. And um, in Ohio, we rated our childcare centers, which I think you do something similar here in uh, Oklahoma but we rated those with a star system. And I noticed pretty early on that there were certain spaces um, where people had opportunities to access the five star rated early learning programs. 
And then there were other communities who had no access to those types of programs at all. In addition to that, in terms of good or bad early learning experiences that they could access, there was also a number of uh, early learning uh, centers that were maybe available. So some, some communities that I worked in maybe had one for the entire county. Um, others, you know, there were many. So I think that that's a piece that, you know, for me early on in my career really um, helped me to start reflecting on what is this idea of equity and how can we um, give people opportunities that are the same uh, across the board. And so this is a nice visual, I think, to represent um, how we can give people what they need to have the same advantages as others. So a cute visual to kind of illustrate the difference between equality and equity. So now what I'd like to do, and um, I was hoping that you all could just maybe reflect for a couple of, um, maybe just a minute or two, on what does this idea of equity mean to you? How have you uh, potentially experienced this in your professional life? Um, maybe personally, this has been something that you've reflected on. So what does this idea of equity versus um, equality mean to you? And then you can answer in the chat box if you feel comfortable to do that. And I will um, try to look at some of the, the chats. If I, I don't know if I have the opportunity to look at the chats. So if people aren't comfortable, that's completely fine. Um, but if you do feel comfortable to answer this question in the chat box, I can uh, reflect on that with you. Okay, so someone says an even playing field. Thank you, Sherry, for uh, contributing access to services. Um, equity in education is a good example when we're thinking of the term equity, which means providing students with the supports they need to be successful in school and in life. And it's ensuring that every child has an equal chance. So Someone, Jennifer, thank you for sharing, says equity means we give people an opportunity to have the same chance at success as everyone else and equal access to services accounting for limitations. Yes. So again, I think um, it's a lot to think about, um, but hopefully um, as you reflect on your professional practice, you can try to think about ways um, in which people um, are really not provided with equitable services. All right, so now moving into um, the idea of cultural competence. Again, this comes from SAMHSA. Uh, their definition from the class standards is the ability of an individual or organization to understand and interact effectively with people who have different values, lifestyles, and traditions based on their heritage and social relationships. So that's a pretty, um, a pretty all-encompassing definition. So we're talking about um, someone understanding and interactive, interacting effectively. So uh, recognizing that there is an ineffective way to interact with people, um, but it's really not just any, anybody, it's people who are different than themselves, right? Um, based on heritage or social relationships. So some of the principles of cultural competence that are important are ensuring community involvement. So from the beginning of services um, in any organization or agency, we want to make sure that we have um, the people who are involved in those services present uh, through the process. And so um, I know I've been um, in organizations and groups because I did a lot of advocacy uh, in Ohio where we didn't obtain community involvement and that's really um, not being culturally competent. Um, it's recognizing that we need to use a population-based definition of the community. So it's not about us as professionals de defining who we're working with. It's we're, let it's we're letting the people that we work with define themselves. So it's really about us sitting back and listening and understanding. Um, 
it's about important, obviously, uh, relevant and culturally appropriate prevention services. So when we're thinking about the prevention side of things, we want to be culturally appropriate. Um, we want to employ culturally competent evaluators. So again, this comes from uh, the health and mental health piece where we start an assessment process. Uh, we want to make sure that people who are uh, in the front lines doing those assessments and screenings that they have some awareness of cultural competence. Um, we want to make sure again to include the target population in all aspects of planning and services. So, you know, when we're thinking about being um, maybe, for example, we want to put in place some trauma informed strategies in our agency. Well, we really need to think about uh, inviting the people who are impacted by those services to the table so that they have an ability to provide some input. It's not about us telling them what they need. And then finally, before we move to the second objective, um, the, the concept of cultural humility. So this doesn't necessarily come from the class standards. Um, this was a different, um, a different definition that was a little bit outside of the cultural competence that comes from class. But I think cultural humility is really what we're striving for. And it's the idea that um, we have to be uh, actively um, really thinking about um, our attitude and, and what we know and how we can learn from the people that we serve. So the principles of cultural humility really are about ongoing self-reflection. And we're going to talk more about this as we get into um, objective three with regard to strategies. But self-reflection is a huge piece to being culturally, hum um, to having cultural humility. It's a lifelong process. So it's not a one and done. You know, we can learn concepts of cultural competence that I think can be more about uh, one and done. But when we're thinking about being um, culturally or having cultural humility, I think we have to acknowledge that this is something that we are constantly and continually embedding in our um, professional practice and in our lives so that we can continue to learn. Because as human beings, we know that we're changing all the time and we continue to change based on the experiences that we have. And so it would be uh, really ridiculous for us to think that you know, um, we can just learn some culturally competent approach and that's all we have to do. So again, this is, um, this is why I think it's important that we acknowledge that to provide culturally, hum uh, to provide services that um, embrace cultural humility, we really have to um, continue to work toward, um, toward cultural competence. So how possible is cultural humility in the work that we do? Um, I think the important piece is to, to really recognize is that as we become more diverse and increase in our diversity across the nation, um, when you look at people who are professionals um, in education and in other helping professions, they're not usually representative of the population that they serve. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and I'm not going to get into all of those, but uh, we will reflect on some of that uh, later. So. Um, it's important that we as professionals um, remain open and engaging, communicative, respectful of sociocultural differences with our clients. Um, so the research shows that if we can do that, we can improve the health and behavioral health outcomes of those clients. So I do think it's important to try to um, have more professionals in education and helping professions that are representative of the population they serve. But I also think if we are not representative that we continue to recognize the importance of learning um, with others about those differences and be open and engaging so that we can have positive experiences and move our clients forward in positive ways. All right, so Objective two, um, we're understanding and thinking and reflecting on how historical discrimination in a region contributes to inequities in services and negative impacts on young children. So again, we're gonna focus a little bit on regional discrimination and how history in a certain region can, um, can really negatively impact the children growing and thriving in that region or maybe not growing and thriving. All right, so this is, um, this is uh, information from a book called um, The Spirit Level. And so these, um, these two researchers, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, I don't know if you all have ever heard of this book, but it's a really um, interesting read. But I pulled this, um, this visual to illustrate 
um, just the dynamics of advantage and disadvantage that are rooted in our history um, really impact uh, the social lives and health of, of people. And so um, these authors um, did some research for decades, honestly, and in, in, in their work found that people who live in economically unequal places tend to live harder lives. So if you look at the x-axis there, it talks a little bit about the index of health and social problems. And so as you go up the x-axis, you'll see that things are getting worse. Um, and then there on the y-axis, um, it shows income, it, income inequality. So they just looked at income inequality as one factor. Obviously, that's not all encompassing um, of um, how we can be economically unequal, but um, it's a major factor. So you'll see that the United States, so they looked across nations and they plotted here on the X and Y, and you'll see that the United States is up there for the worst uh, health and social problems um, in the areas where there's income inequality. And so I think this speaks to um, the inequity of resources and the biases that justify those inequities that are really long-term historical biases that we hold in this country. How they have such a huge impact on the lives of young children, um, uh, their impact their social lives and their health. So um, it's a good illustration, I think, of how we are really not getting it right in this country. So what are some of the systemic issues that contribute to um, discrimination and racism. This, this slide is actually from my perspective. Um, I just, uh, as, as I've really reflected on this topic and, and, you know, my own personal research, I think that there are some systemic issues contributing to, to our um, issues with this. I think one of the things is that people live in a regionally segregated bubble. So for me, again, I told you in the beginning of this presentation, you know, I'm from Ohio. I actually um, lived outside of the Cincinnati area in a very rural um, Appalachian culture. So most of the people that lived and worked in this county outside of Cincinnati were white. Um, and a lot of them drove into uh, the Cincinnati area for work. So really that was the, the extent of their experiences. Um, so I think that that contributes to, um, to some of the discriminatory practices and racism that exist. Um, they're only influenced by those limited um, experiences. People operate most of their lives based on a few experiences. So not a lot of people get outside of that regional bubble and nor do they experience things um, in various ways. So most of us, when we start our jobs or start to work, um, we, you know, we hold a job for quite a long time. So we have, you know, the same coworkers. We live in certain family systems that continue to be the same over time. So we have few experiences that can impact us in a way that helps um, really change that systemic uh, contribution of discrimination and racism. The educational system um, is a contributing factor when we're thinking of systemic um, issues. So, um, when we think about education and um, when we reflect on the history of our nation and um, just historical implications of really racism and discrimination, a lot of children who are um, in school systems are really not getting the full picture of history, right? They're only getting the limited uh, pieces that their teachers uh, tend to um, use as subjects, right? Family context, interge intergenerational transmission of acceptance or intolerance. So depending on what your family system looks like, what they talk about in terms of uh, other people who are different or the same, and how they feel about that impacts, um, you know, your ability to understand discrimination and racism and, you know, sort of where you, what your lens looks like. Um, our access to resources is often limiting. Um, so depending on where you live, um, your access might be better. I know there's some very rural areas here in the Oklahoma state and there were in Ohio as well. Um, so again, what is, what is your opportunity and access to resources look like? And then I think that the internet, although it increases people's access to other information that's out there and sort of a bigger lens and a bigger bubble, most of the time people access information that supports their biased viewpoint. So I think a good example of this from my perspective is if I, you know, if I'm a Democrat, which is the only time I'm going to talk about politics, if I were a Democrat and I wanted to get online and look up some information 
about uh, who's running for um, you know, the governor in my state, I'm going to probably research and find information about uh, the Democratic governor, the, or the, at least the person who's running uh, from the Democratic Party, right? So I'm going to support or find research or information that supports my viewpoint and my political party. Okay, so this uh, information comes from um, Jones, who uh, wrote an article in 2000. A great article was titled Levels of Racism, A Theoretical Framework, and a Garden's, Gardener's Tale. I highly recommend, it's on my resources um, slide. I highly recommend if you have an opportunity, um, when I do a, a longer training piece on this topic, we, we really dive into that article because the Gardener's Tale really helps to il illustrate these perspectives that help us to understand discrimination and racism um, that really contribute to the health disparities that we're talking about. So institutionalized racism is the first one. And um, that's the systemic distribution of resources, power, or opportunity in our society to benefit a long history, I'm sorry, to benefit people who are white with the exclusion of people of color. So present day racism, so those feelings of um, uh, racist, uh, racism and uh, race, racial privilege was really built on the history of racially distributed uh, resources. So examples of institutionalized racism, segregation in schools is a really big example. Uh, reservations uh, that, that are in operation, um, that were in operation that were um, historically um, distributed based on, um, you know, people of color. The second one is personally mediated racism or discrimination. So this is more of an interpersonal level of racism and it's really defined by prejudice and discrimination um, that happens uh, on an individual level that it's about assumptions about the abilities and motives and intentions of others according to their race. So <laughs> it can also be uh, differential actions that we have towards others based on their, um, their race or ethnicity. So, for this one, it's um, really the idea that one encounter or maybe something that I saw, um, you know, in a movie about a certain race or um, a certain person of certain ethnicity really determines how I believe um, a, about those, that person in that, you know, in that one interaction or maybe that one uh, excerpt that I saw on some media, right? So the abilities and motives and intentions of all of the people that are um, a part of that race or ethnicity are based on that limited um, experience. And so again, this is an interpersonal. So uh, uh, persistent familial racism or implicit bias based on like that one experience or perception that I had. The third perspective is internalized racism. And so this occurs when members of a group um, who are stigmatized by racism start to believe those negative messages about themselves and they come to accept a low value of their intrinsic worth. Um, this idea, this is the idea of learned helplessness. Okay, um, so as we move forward, um, I think um, one of the things that is important to illustrate is really just a couple examples of a institutional racism because that's what we're focusing on today so that's uh, potentially impacted by our region and then we'll look a little bit at personally mediated racism so um, the Ohio State University has a, um, an, a an entity called the Kerwin Institute for the study of race and ethnicity and I was obviously very influenced by um, some of the information that they disseminated I went to quite a few trainings that they provided but um, it really helps us to understand institutional racism when we think a little bit about housing in America. So I'm going to read this information from uh, this particular research study and article that the Kerwin Institute put forth. Um, there's a clear record of the impact of structural racism on opportunities of people of color in home buying and credit access. It is a process by which policies, organizations, systems, and culture interact across, across institutional domains to produce and sustain racial inequality. Historically, people of color have been restricted from buying homes in particular neighborhoods, regardless of the ability to pay 
through practices of racial covenants or redlining. So I think it's important to acknowledge that this is one um, continued um, structural um, racist practice that is still in operation in many of uh, the certain regions in our country today. All right, so W.E.B. Uh, Dubois, for, um, for as, to use as an example, a um, hundred years ago acknowledged the health of minority populations. So he, he was talking about health disparities a hundred years ago and he talked a little bit about the social institutions um, that were in operation around them. And one of the things he, he looked at was um, he was a sociologist as well as an advocate and um, he, he did a lot of um, activism uh, in his time. He died in the mid 60s, but he talked about uh, people of color being restricted from buying homes in particular neighborhoods. And again, it had to do with their, um, their race and it was regardless of their ability to pay. And he looked at um, some of the racial practices and the segregation um, that, was, that was happening at that time. So housing, uh, as we look at it from um, a historical perspective, can still influence our daily lives. Um, and it really has to do with access to safe and affordable housing that we can find in communities. Um, but depending on where you live and where you're able to obtain um, housing, it has to, uh, it, it positively or negatively impacts our ability to be well, right? So our community well-being and our individual well-being. And this obviously impacts the children who are living in those communities. So I, if I had to ask you about the the community that you lived or the city that you lived, um, and I'm new to Tulsa, but I would assume that most people know in their area what, what spaces are more um, supported by resources and access, right? So you would know what areas that you would like to live in in your town or your city uh, versus which areas you would like to stay away from. And so those are the things that impact um, health outcomes, uh, mental health outcomes long term. Personally mediated racism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about implicit bias. So I, I found this cartoon that I think was a really good illustration of, excuse me, implicit bias and how it um, impacts our interactions. So we've got a white gentleman here. Um, looks like he's in a nice suit there. And he's got a wine glass that's half full. And it's much larger than the African-American woman who he's sitting next to right at this bar. So he says, the difference between you and me is I see my glass as half full. Completely unaware of the white privilege that he's operating from and the bias that he holds. So um, what, are we, what are we reflecting on when we think of implicit bias? This is the unconscious attribution of particular qualities to a member of a certain social group. So that can be along the lines of race, ethnicity, many other social constructs, but it's something that all people have and it negatively affects, typically, it negatively affect, affects interactions between groups um, if we don't address it. And so it's really about how our minds work. So it really um, is about biology and how we put people into social groups um, really for safety. I mean, that's the real underlying biological reason that implicit bias exists. It's not about if we're good or bad people, right? We all operate from a certain um, implicit, from certain implicit biases that we hold, and we're not always consciously aware of those. So, you know, labeling ourselves as good as ba or bad based on our implicit bias is really unfair. Um, we have them, they impact our attitudes, they impact our beliefs and our behaviors. And so it's important to reflect on what our biases might be. Um, in, uh, so, so Carol Daly is, a, is an author for the um, journal Issues in Mental Health Nursing. And she talked a little bit about this idea of implicit bias um, and how it really is a biological um, construct that starts in our brains, right? And it starts with a feeling that we have. So our feelings are emotional um, reactions, um, you know, in ways that our brain has triggered, right? So when we think about our bias um, and we make statements like, for example, I just don't understand, that is coming from a feeling of ignorance, right? I don't know. Um, if we say things like I'm not on the same level, right? So that comes from that place of inferiority, right? That learned helplessness. I just um, I just know that I'm not on that level with that person. Um, I, 
And I always, whenever I see this, this particular statement, I always think uh, when I was younger, my dad always said, you know, we all put our pants on the same way. Um, other, other statements, I'm scared of them. So this comes from a place of fear. My life is always so hard. Again, the, the feeling of depression or sadness. Um, those people, so again, differentiating between me and someone else, those people make things worse. So from my perspective, this comes from a place of anger and then it can um, increase into hostility. The way that they do things is disgusting. Well, then we start getting hostile, right? That's a hostile emotion and it impacts the statements we make and then our behaviors. And then this place of aggressiveness. So I'll show them, right? So when we experience these, um, these emotions, right? It contributes to the behaviors that we engage. And I think that uh, the place of anger and hostility and aggressiveness often comes from those biases that we hold, um, which stems from many interactions and experiences that we've had. So over time, people are impacted by the historical story that's been told, especially young children. Um, this is some new information that I just received in my inbox. So hopefully you guys can have an opportunity to look at the stateofbabies.org. But um, the State of Babies Yearbook 2020 shows that um, uh, the United States, um, the state that the United States is in, where a baby is born, so the where, again, the region, impacts their chance for a strong start in life. So we have to acknowledge that babies that are born in certain areas um, are going to have um, negative health outcomes. The report further highlights that major disparities that begin before birth, especially for black children, are driven by systemic racism and social injustice. So pre-birth, our children, our young children are impacted by um, racism and discrimination. So over time, external forces influence our DNA. Epigenetics is a potential uh, impact. Um, so the theory that beliefs, experiences, and other uh, environmental factors, not just our individual um, state of DNA, but other generations, right? So our genes can actually, our genetic action, genetic activity can actually shift as a result of some of the stress and oppression that we experience. And this definitely happens with our young children. So are their DNA actually being changed? So another cartoon to illustrate implicit bias, that's the racist bone in your body that you claimed you didn't have. All right, so to summarize the previous slides, um, the perpetuation of negative beliefs about a certain group of people based on where they live, how they live, and the color of their skin creates bias among community members and professionals. It's, it's a fact, right? It's a reality. The inequity of resources and the biases that justify those in, in, inequities have an enormous impact on young children's lives and their ability to attain health. The children that are living those particular experiences from those certain uh, sectors of their communities may have changed DNA as a result of the inequities that they've experienced. And it may not even be their personal experiences, it may be their parents' experiences or their grandparents' experiences. All right, guys, I'm gonna flip through this reflection question. We really don't have time to spend on it, um, but for, for later reflection, um, just think a little bit about ways that you have seen experiences and feelings passed down or shared from one generation to the next that contribute to discrimination and racism. Our HR director put this in our inbox earlier this week and I wanted to share it with all of you. Quote from Walt Disney, the flower that blooms in adversity is the rarest and most beautiful of all. So let's move into objective three. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about anti-bias and diversity informed practice so that we can combat this historical discrimination and help young children thrive. So the vision of anti-bias, um, I think the, the best one honestly comes from this uh, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Child. And this was um, set forth in 1989 so these four um, declarations of children's rights, I think are impactful, right? The right to survival, the right to develop to the fullest. And again, that development is impacted by where a child lives. Um, the right to protection from harmful influences, abuse and or exploitation. Children have the right to be protected from those things, right? So we have to try to, um, again, 
be culturally human, uh, in, put in place culturally um, competent practices so that we can support children. And then the right to participate fully in family, cultural, and social life. So we wanna make sure that our children feel positive about their family and cultural interactions. The social engagements that they have um, are important to them and they should be able to embrace those. Uh, in addition, children and adults can respectfully and easily live, learn, and work together in diverse and inclusive environments. So we want people to feel good um, about where they live and who, they, um, who, who are they surrounded by and safe, right? All children and families have a sense of belonging and experience affirmation of their identities and cultural ways of being. So we want people to feel good and positive about who they are and how they interact um, from a cultural lens. All children and families live in safe and peaceful and healthy environments. So we want this for our citizens and we want this for young children. And all families have the resources they need to fully nurture and support their children. This is definitely a mission of the Parent Child Center. We wanna make sure that um, everybody has what they need um, in an equitable way. So when we think about embracing cultural humility um, to reduce those health disparities, um, this is a, an organization that actually operates in Ohio, the Prevention Action Alliance. They state, cultural diversity, competence, and humility is a foundational component to effective and impactful prevention services, but it cannot be fully realized while certain members of our communities are purposefully harmed by systems of oppression and violence that have been in place for too long. Everyone has a role in prevention. Okay, let's look at uh, diversity informed practice and how this can be impactful for young children. So the zero to three defines diversity informed practice as a dynamic system of beliefs and values that strives for the highest levels of diversity, inclusion and equity. It's partnering with others. And so there are several tenants. I'm just gonna read the tenants. Um, if you all want to have um, uh, this, you can look it up online, Irving Harris Foundation's Diversity Informed Tenants. Uh, you can do a Google search, or if, you, if you'd like to, you can email me and I can send you the article um, with all of these listed. So self-awareness leads to better services for families. We want to champion children's rights globally, so we know that children are citizens of the world, right? Not just their small pocket. We want to work to acknowledge privilege and combat discrimination. We want to recognize and respect non-dominant bodies of knowledge. So again, that lens with which we seek out information, we know that there are, are other, um, there is other information out there that could be impactful and can be a source of strength. We want to uh, uh, honor diverse family structures that may be different from what we know. We want to understand that lang language can hurt or heal. So we recognize the power of what we say. We want to support families in their preferred language. We want to allocate resources to systemic change. We want to make space and open pathways so that children are not marginalized. And we want to advance policy that supports all families. So I think these tenants are really important, but the first tenant talks about self-awareness. So for me, if we think about self-awareness, it's really about reflective practice. So how are we reflecting on our values, beliefs, and bias? Are we exploring the impact that it has on our interactions with others? We have to analyze the role of contextual forces in our practice and our relationships with families, children, and colleagues. And we have to address the barriers that we have to diversity informed practice. So when we think about those tenants, what are our barriers to achieving those? Again, we don't have time for this. Um, so how are you engaging in reflective practice? Do you set aside some time to reflect on a regular basis? So I think it's a really important piece. Um, and the other piece is as we reflect on some of our values and potential biases, who are we talking to about um, you know, that reflection. Do we have an opportunity to reflect with another person that can be supportive and help us um, move in a way that is uh, from a vision of anti-bias and diversity informed? Okay, 
so that was a lot. Um, it looks like we're at 11.45. I want to end with a positive takeaway message. So I don't know if you've seen this um, video, but I think it's important. It is a three minute video, but I wanted to take the time to show this. Um, it was a lot of information and a pretty heavy topic. And so I thought it was important today that we take some time to, at the end, have a positive message. So I hope that you all will find this beneficial. We all have different religions, but we have universal love as well. <laughs> I love my sister. Love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Okay, um, here's my uh, references. Again, I think this is going to be provided to you um, after today. <sighs> All right, thank you. I appreciate everyone's time today. It went really quickly. Um, I think I ended right on time. So I guess um, we'll open to questions. Is that where we're at in the, in the presentation? Thank you, Nicole. Uh, what an ending. <laughs> the video, uh, I'm seriously, I had tears in my eyes. Very it's impressive. Okay. <laughs> okay, we will give them a few seconds and see if we have questions. Um, I guess, uh, do did you put the link to the video in your PowerPoint? I mean, can well, we see it? I didn't, but um, I can do so that. Can you, if... can you send it to me uh, by email and I can send it to them so they can find it? And yes, I can find it. Yes, <laughs> of course. You. I definitely will do that. Thank you. So do we have questions? Right now we just have comments that said, thank you. Um, this is a very important topic. We all have bias, whether we know it or not. Oh, here's a question. What is your best response to all lives matter? My best response. So is this a question session or a test? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think for me that um, that end video that I showed is really sums it up for me uh, personally and professionally. I think that, um, you know, we all have an important role, uh, despite what we do professionally, to, to positively impact um, the importance of life. And especially if we work with young children, um, I think that that is just such a a prime opportunity to be impactful. And I think that um, it's a good opportunity really too to teach um, some of these concepts to, to, our, to the youngest members of our communities um, because we do all matter. So we have some more comments. You did such a great job. Thank you so much. I learned so much and will be challenging myself to learn more about practicing cultural humility. Definitely just looking for advice. Thank you for sharing this important information. Thank you. Okay, so if we do not have any more questions, uh, or you can open the mic uh, if you would like to ask. Uh, that's all totally okay. And if not, we will say goodbye and wish you a very peaceful, calm, and um, amazing weekend. What a beautiful... Um, video to go into the weekend with. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much for your presentation today. And um, Nicole is going to be with us next Friday also. So please tracking our link for registration and join us if you would like to. Thank you, Nicole.